I have been told that Dorothy Mowinkle's brother has passed away, and his funeral is going to be tomorrow. Dorothy, we are sorry to hear about that in your family. Uh, evidently, that is going to be here in Clinton, so we are making note of that. I want to share with you something tonight that I have shared with you before. As a matter of fact, about uh, two and a half years ago, I did a four-week series on what Christians should know about the Quran, and then very promptly after that, I had a heart attack. I'm really hoping that we don't have a follow-up on this tonight, uh, but in our course of talking about our own spiritual roots, talking about where our faith came from and what it has been through, we have come to that period of time that it is a, a proper thing for us to talk about the subject of Islam again. Now, I am under no illusion at all that anybody remembers anything that I said two and a half years ago. So I kind of feel like if I hadn't said anything about it, you might not have remembered, and this could be a brand new fresh lesson. However, I will tell you I'm drawing from some of that material. Uh, the rise of Islam is an important event for us to notice. In the history of our own faith, we can see that there have been times of great expansion and the flourishing of Christianity. There have been times that it just, it, it seemed to enter into a culture and then enlighten the entire culture and, and made things better. And there have been times that Christianity has come under attack and has come up against the forces of evil, as our New Testament says. There have been times that Christianity has been challenged in a very open way. And for us to see what has happened in the past is a healthy thing for us. The more I look at the history of this particular subject, I wonder whether I'm reading history or whether I'm reading a newspaper. Because we are living in a time in which Islam is again on the rise. So I would like to take a few minutes tonight and just talk about what Islam is and why it arose and how it is challenging us. It has been challenging through the centuries, but it is again challenging us today. And I'd like to point out a few of those things. I do this because as we're talking about the history of our own faith, the roots of our own faith, we need to understand that this is really a very predictable thing, that there will be occasions on which some other philosophy of man rises up and challenges, if you want to say, the status quo. It is a reason for us to never be lax in the practice of our faith. We need to be aware of things that are going on around us. And in this case, let me share a few things that are happening starting a few centuries ago, several centuries ago, and are enduring to this day. If we wanted to talk just about the story of Muhammad, and if somebody looks up at the screen and says, Muhammad, if you question the spelling of that, go ahead and bring it up online. You can find it spelled in about a half dozen different ways. Uh, and that, the reason for that is translating out of the Semitic languages, which would include Hebrew, by the way, uh, when you translate into English, sometimes the transliteration is very difficult and you get different spellings. We ran into that a couple of years ago when we talked about the word Quran itself. You may see it spelled with a K or you may see it spelled with a Q. And that's all a matter of transliteration of the languages. There's no, nothing inconsistent or, or wrong in this case. It's just a variance that occurs. It was in the year 570 that Muhammad was born. He was born in the, on the Saudi Arabian Peninsula in the town of Mecca. At that time, Christianity was six centuries old. It had 
spread its influence through parts of Saudi Arabia, including where Mecca was. But then it had kind of grown stale. And the zeal that brought Christianity to the Saudi Arabian Peninsula became an established religion that in and of itself had its own inconsistencies. Of course, Christianity was spreading in other directions very quickly. At this time, if we'd go back and and look at this particular time frame, a hundred years either direction from this point, we see Christianity has already reached Great Britain and it has engulfed the greater part of all of Europe. It has gone into what we now know as Russia. It has taken up a very good portion of Africa and it has spread east as far, at least as far as India and perhaps even farther into Southeast Asia than that. Uh, so Christianity was, was growing in a lot of ways and in a lot of places it was flourishing. But in Mecca there was a problem. There were some things that were going on that were keeping people from being enthusiastically Christian. And so we see the rise of this individual. Just to bring the, the storyline together, it wasn't until about 610 that he started setting forth his teachings. It was in the year 610 that he supposedly received the first of his messages from God, his surahs. If you remember, the Quran itself is not divided into books like our Bible is. It's divided into 114 different surahs or chapters. Some of them are very long. Some of them are very short. But his first surah he received in 610, he continued to receive those, supposedly, through 632 A.D. And he recorded all of these surahs and set them forth as teachings from God. Within those writings, we will read about Jesus. We'll read about Adam and Eve and Noah and Abraham and Isaac a little bit about Jacob, but much more about Ishmael. We will read about David and Solomon and Job and Daniel. We read about a number of characters that are very familiar to us in our Bible. And these individuals are all spoken of with respect in the Quran. Muhammad himself as we mentioned this morning, he was a respecter of Jesus. He did not recognize Jesus as deity. He did not recognize Jesus as being what the Jews called the Messiah. He recognized Jesus as a prophet. But then he inserted himself, Muhammad inserted himself in the line of the prophets. And since he was, in his teachings, the final prophet then his teachings were said to be supreme. The influence of his teachings was at first very, very limited. Uh, He went about Mecca trying to convince people of his influence and his wisdom. And there were a few people that followed, but not very many. As a matter of fact, it got to the point that some of the people of Mecca just kind of got tired of him and insisted on him leaving. That is not exactly the story that we would receive through the Islamic teaching, but that's kind of what happened. He went from that time to Medina. And I want to talk in a minute about the significance of the move from Mecca to Medina. But it was in Medina that... that Islam became a very powerful religion. And from that point on, we see the spread of Islam in a very dramatic way. Over the next few centuries, uh, Islam tried to make it up into Europe. Was, uh, it went first across northern Africa 
and then up into Spain and pretty much took all of Spain and then started moving into France and at at the city of Tours in France there was a battle the battle of Tours wherein uh, the Islamic army was stopped and turned back by the forces of Europe I bet you didn't even know that there was ever a successful battle in in France like that but back at that time but there was um, significant point in history, very significant. Well, from that point on, we see the influence of Muhammad spreading throughout the Middle East, through southwestern Asia, where it is still very much at home. Uh, a number of countries that are easily identifiable today as Islamic countries are very strong. The religion of, of Islam is very powerful today. Uh, it is, there are more than a billion people who identify themselves as Islamic. As compared, by the way, to Christianity where there's about two billion in the world or, or perhaps even more than that that identify themselves in a broad spectrum of Christian. So Islam is not as big as Christianity, but it is still a world power, a very powerful force in our world today. When the move uh, occurred from Mecca to Medina, this is a very important point, and it answers a lot of questions today, because in Mecca, the, the forces of Islam, the people who identified themselves as, as Muslim, were very small, and therefore not very strong, and therefore not very influential. While they were there, their teaching was very peaceful. While they were in the minority, their teaching was peaceful. But when they moved to Medina, for some reason, this new influence into Medina and the way that it was handled and the way that it was accepted, it was very soon that the people of Medina, for the most part, accepted Muhammad as a prophet of God and began to follow him in a very enthusiastic way. And when they became the majority of the population, then their teachings shifted from being entirely peaceful to being very forceful. They felt in, in that community where they were in the majority, they felt that they had the right to dictate pretty much every secular law that was around. And they adopt, adapted and adopted a new form of legal system that wherein we, we've seen in other parts of history where the religious authority and the civil authority became one. And that's what happened in Medina, and that's what happened clear across northern Africa as Islam spread. The forces of of Muhammad would move into a city and would give that city the option of becoming Muslim. And, and, and let me just say, I'm using a number of terms interchangeably here. Islam, Muslim, Muslim. Mo, we used to call them Mohammedans. That's kind of out, but, but that's all talking about the same thing. But when the forces of Islam would move into a city in northern Africa, they would very often meet with the city leaders, give them the option of converting to Islam or being conquered. And there were cases where both things happened. There were many cases where the city said, well, don't destroy us, we'll become Muslims. But there were some cases in which the villages, the cities stood up and said, no, we will not. And those places were pretty much wiped out. Because in the, in the teachings of Muhammad, truly this is a place in their minds where might makes right. And if you are the stronger power, and if you are the righteous power in their eyes, you have the right to take the lives of those who would oppose you. And therefore it is a system that is ruled very strongly by its own strength. The move from Mecca to Medina 
I believe is key in our understanding of what's happening in the world today. Still today, where Islam is in the minority, it still teaches outwardly a great deal of peace. It's its main emphasis. But where it becomes the majority, then there is very often, trailing behind that very quickly, the insistence of changing the civil laws to Sharia law, which means the law of the Islamic community, and everything changes as the, at that point. A few years ago, the people of our fine little state of Oklahoma passed a law that uh, our laws would not be governed by Sharia law. And the rest of the country laughed at us at that point. It appears to me that there's more and more of our country that's beginning to understand what is going on. Because there are places in the world today and there are places in our country in which Sharia law is being practiced. And when that happens, then the peacefulness of the religion is set aside and the force of the religion is brought forth. Why would these things ever happen? What, what occurred that opened the door to this such different teaching? If they had the teachings of Christ, why would they turn away from that? Well, as I gave you in former lessons, I give you now seven reasons that I think opened the door, seven things that opened the door to the power of Islam in the world today. First of all, there was an accepted monotheism, the belief in one God. Keep in mind, in a great part of the world before this, polytheism was the rule. Uh, Abraham grew up in a polytheistic Chaldean area, and they had the, all the gods of the Chaldeans and, and so forth up there. Moses grew up in Egypt where there was a polytheistic religion. Many, many gods. We have the gods of the Romans and the gods of the Greeks, and, and we can go in different places, and, and many places, even most places, were polytheistic. But in Saudi Arabia, the people had been convinced of monotheism. They were convinced that there was one God. They had been influenced by both the Jews and the Christians. And therefore, that entire population was already pretty much monotheistic. But as those people looked around, they started seeing inconsistencies in the Jewish and Christian practices. When I say inconsistencies, you can translate that and read that hypocrisy. When people said that they were Christians, but they didn't live like they were Christians, the people who were not Christians saw the fallacy in that. I might add, they still do. If we're going to claim to be Christian, we need to be consistent. We do not need to betray our own faith by inconsistencies. But the people of Saudi Arabia saw that what they claimed Christianity was and what was being practiced were not the same thing. They saw the same thing in the Jewish world. They had a respect for Abraham. They even identified themselves as children of Abraham. Where we would follow the, the lineage, where Christians and Jews would follow the lineage of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, they follow the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Ishmael. But they identify themselves as children of Abraham, and they take great pride in that. But looking at the Jewish practices and at the Christian practices, they were not at all impressed because what they were seeing practiced by people actually turned them away from those organized religions. And it made the people think that there must be some alternative. Because of this, I believe that there was a spiritual vacuum on the Saudi Arabian Peninsula at that time where the people were not convinced of Judaism. They were not convinced of Christianity. And yet... Along with that, there was this innate spiritual hunger that was alive. 
I believe it's put within all mankind. There is a spiritual desire for us to be connected with our Creator. And those people were feeling that. But because they had this deep spiritual desire, but they were not seeing it practiced anywhere in a consistent and, and desirous way, they were ready to open up their lives to something else. There was also alive at this time a deep and a rich, proud Arab heritage. Keep in mind, the Arabs are a very proud people. There would be some today who would cynically say, well, what did they ever do? Actually, if you look at the history of the Arabian nations, they do some very significant things. In the world of science, they were the leaders for a while. In the world of mathematics, they were leaders. They were the ones who brought us algebra and other evil forces like that. Uh, but uh, they, they have a deep and rich... I'm sorry, math teachers, but, you know. Um, they have this deep and rich view of themselves as the Arab people. And so they were proud of that. Well, when you put that Arab pride in the midst of inconsistencies of religions that came from seemingly outside the Arab world, then the door begins to open. They also took great pride in the fact that they were a people of thought. They were intrigued and they were attracted to the Greek way of thinking, and that is the reasoning and the debate that would go on among the Greeks. They looked back at Plato and Aristotle, and they were intrigued by the argumentation that went on and the logic that was involved in their, their sources of reasoning. And they were attracted to that. And so you take all of these things and you put them together and you need yet one more element, and that is a charismatic leader. One person to stand up with a convincing line for the rest of the people and the people are ready to follow and that's exactly what happened Muhammad was of such a nature that he evidently attracted a lot of attention he'd grown up in kind of a rough childhood actually his mother died uh, very shortly after his birth his father was already dead um, he was raised he was handed over to a grandfather to be raised who died two years later he was given to an uncle and the uncle brought him up. He was influenced by a lot of people, but he lived a rough life. But because he did that, people were more attracted to him. And he was convincing in his speech. And he was powerful. And he made the people proud to be Arabs. And therefore, the people were ready to follow him. When you put all those things together, you can see it's easy for this new religion to take deep roots in a hurry. And thus it did. There were some things that immediately became challenges to Christianity from the world of Islam. The things that became challenges to them, I believe, are still forces today that we are having to reckon with. Let me share with you a few of the direct challenges. First of all, foremost above everything else in our context, from the Islamic point of view, there is the denial of Jesus as the Christ. Two and a half years ago, when I shared with you all the information that I shared, I pointed out the one major difference. The first night we talked about the similarities between Islam and Christianity, and there are many. And the second night we talked about the differences. And there are many. The third night, we talked about the one major difference. And this is above everything else. And that one major difference is our view of Jesus. Muhammad taught that Jesus was a prophet, a good man, to be respected, to be admired. But he was not God in the flesh. And there were certain elements of Jesus' life that Muhammad outright denied. Jesus was not crucified. He certainly was not resurrected. A number of things that are an outright denial of our view of Jesus. 
Now, if someone comes along today, as if someone came along at that time, and were, they were ready to take the position of Christianity and to defend the cause of Christ, we talked about them very early in this series when we talked about the early Christian apologists, those who stood up and defended the faith. There is perhaps a need today for apologists to stand up again. The problem is we live in such a politically correct world that for us to dare say that someone else might be wrong, the rest of the world looks at us and says, how dare you say that? But if they claim that Jesus was nothing more than just a good man, perhaps even a prophet, but we claim that he was deity, somebody's wrong. We cannot both be right. Even in a politically correct world, the Islamic world and the Christian world, and I might insert the Jewish world and all the other worlds in which we share space, everybody can't be right because there are some outright discrepancies between these belief systems. If we are willing to stand up, we do not ever have to settle for, well, you believe what you'll believe and I'll believe what I believe. That is the cheapest, shoddiest way out of a conversation that anybody can come up with. If we have the opportunity to discuss Christ, we are not the people that are to back down and say, well, everybody's got their right to their own belief. Not if we are pursuing the righteousness of God. If we are truly pursuing God, we will see what is consistent with the revelation of God in his nature all through history, not just through the eyes of Muhammad. And we are in a position to defend our Christian faith in a very powerful way. And let us use the logic and let us use the reasoning, but let us use the evidence that is set forth. And if we find that it is the voice of Muhammad standing against the revelation of the apostles, then choose this day who you will believe. But the evidence is strongly on the side of Christianity. Now that cannot be discussed openly. And the press will never give us equal status on that. Gerald, I'm not attacking the press. But, but in the public eye, we have to say everybody's okay. I don't see how a person can claim their discipleship as, as Christians and then settle for being politically correct. There is this element of who Jesus is, is the biggest challenge. But then there are other challenges that are coming along too. We are seeing more and more the use of force as a growth method. If you want to see a real demonstration of this, look in the country of Nigeria today. Listen to the news tonight, and it will be mentioned. Because a few weeks ago, an Islamic group kidnapped 250 or 300 schoolgirls. And we don't know what's happened to them since. There is the idea that they either will be or have been sold into slavery, which means sexual slavery, or... Perhaps they're being used as a negotiating thing. We don't know. But what is happening, the Islamic world, the, that sect of Islam, is so intimidated by the idea of girls receiving an education that they had to use force against it. There are even some of our politically correct people in the United States, some of them even out of Hollywood, that are beginning to say there's something terribly wrong here and maybe everybody isn't right. 
I know that there will be some that will say, well, but that's just one group out of Islam, one radical group doing something stupid. And yes, we can point to some groups that have identified themselves as Christians who have done radically stupid things. But stepping back and seeing the whole of what the, teach what the teachings of the religions actually are, if we examine what the Bible actually teaches and what the Quran actually teaches, we will see that the Quran opens the door for the use of force if need be. That is a dramatic difference in philosophies. And it is something we are challenged with today. There is also the issue of the misrepresentation of God. The question often is, is the God of Islam the same as the God of Christianity? And I have shared with you before, yes, I think we have to say it is the same God because both religions claim that it is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Or Abraham, Isaac, and Ishmael. But in looking at at what we are seeing here represented by God, God has revealed himself in particular ways. And Islam has betrayed that. Islam has taken that which has been revealed and is directly countering that. And within the pages of the of Quran, you will see that directly addressed. It will say something to the effect of, those of prior revelation say this. But then the Quran teaches something else. And when it says those of prior revelation, it's talking about Christians and Jews. There is a very different idea of who God is. Is he the same God? Yes, but we don't have the same understanding of that God. Because the God of, of Christianity, even the God of the Jewish world, is a God of loving kindness. His mercy is great. And his love is astounding. And that is the God who has created mankind and has revealed that to us. But in the world of Islam, God is a God of force, a God who is willing to demonstrate his hate. It is a God who hates. And we're not talking about the same understanding of God. Another issue is that the Muslims have rewritten history. What the Quran teaches is not what the te Bible teaches about history. Many of our politically correct friends would say, well, then who's to say which is right? I would simply point out that in any established historic understanding, we always try to go to the earliest possible sources. We go to the oldest sources to see what was revealed because it gets us back closer to the fact. Which scripture is older? We have the scripture of Islam that was established between 610 and 632 AD. We have the scripture of the Christians and Jews that combined that scripture was completed before the end of the first century. We also have that scripture that was revealed to us in particular ways through many prophets, not just through one man. But in many prophets and in many ways, says Hebrews. And so we have a, a, a plethora of, of sources teaching one thing from an older source. And then we have one voice in Islam coming along and trying to change what Bible history was all about. It's a discrepancy. And it's something we have to deal with as we see the challenges from Islam. And then finally, I would finish with this. One of the direct challenges from Islam is the negative social effects of Islam. Can there be any question in looking at law, can there be any question about which systems honor women the most? I do not understand why anybody, any woman, can think Islamic way of life is attractive. Because women are at best second-rate citizens. And within the Quran, it gives permission for husbands to beat their wives. But when we get to New Testament scripture,
was previously written that husbands are to love their wives, treat them with respect. There is such a dramatic difference in the treatment of women. There is a dramatic difference as we see the Islamic world rejecting ideals and Western education. If they want to disrespect the United States, that is their privilege. We are the great Satan in their eyes. And they may not... Honestly, if you look at some of the things that go on in the American culture and you compare that to the morality, whatever that morality might be in the Islamic world, if you want to compare very strict morality to what goes on in a great many American cities, what is displayed in our movies and on our television, you can understand why the rest of the world would look at America as being a land of utter sin. We know that within our system, there are a great many of us who do not hold to the immorality that is so paraded before the public. But from the world of the Middle East, they don't see that as clearly. And therefore, they are critical of Western ways of thinking. In that sense, we can somewhat understand. But when they take that to the extent of rejecting Western practices and therefore excusing the annihilation of education for women and the kidnapping of girls and the acts of terror done in the name of Allah, then we obviously see that there are dramatic social effects have to be dealt with. Don't tell me that one system is as good as another. If we want to see just how each system plays out and how it ultimately treats its own people, look at the world of Islam and look at the world of Christianity. It is an amazing thing that we can see such dramatic differences. If you walk into a, a, an Islamic city it is very clear. The world of Islam does not have respect for nature in the same way. It doesn't have respect for people in the same way. It wasn't too long ago that there was a conversation that took place on Facebook one time. And there were some people on there basically saying, well, they have their right and we have our right and one system is as good as another. And I usually don't get involved in those conversations. But I had to be involved and I stuck in, have you ever lived in an Arab country? And the conversation was over. I had the privilege of living in a Muslim country for a year and a half. And that was, at that time, a friendly government to the United States. And yet the way people are treated is so dramatically different. The treatment of unbelievers is an issue. How does Christianity treat one who does not believe in Christ? Well, we're supposed to do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith, but we're supposed to do good for everybody. We're supposed to be compassionate towards everybody. We're supposed to show love to everybody. We're supposed to love people just because they're people. Not in the Islamic world. If you are Islamic, then you are loved. If you are not, then you are a target. And anything that they want to do to you in the name of Islam is perfectly okay. There is a dramatic difference. And then I would also add in this. The, the, one of the negative social effects that we're having to deal with today is in the world of economic stability. The World is Flat is a book that was written several years ago and it was talking about the economic flatness of the world, how all the cultures of the world are kind of flattening out so that we interact equally with each other economically. It's a part of what is called supply line economics. Uh, it is displayed when you order a, is it a Dell computer, 
that comes from Indonesia. It probably has gotten its parts from China and Pakistan and Vietnam and Australia. And it puts those parts together and it ships them to America. And all of those countries have to work together for their product to come out. And if somebody starts a war, then they get cut out of the supply line and their economy crashes. That book gives credit to supply line economics as the reason that India and Pakistan did not go to nuclear war a few years ago. Because neither of those countries wanted to get kicked out of the supply line of world economics. I will also tell you, it is in that book that it points out that no two countries who both have a McDonald's have ever gone to war against each other. Now, it has nothing to do with McDonald's. It has everything to do with world economies. And countries who want to stay on good terms with other countries, they play well with other children. Well, folks, the Islamic world doesn't play well with other children. And you can see the difference. Go ahead and look at the aerial photos of Islamic countries as opposed to Christian or Jewish settlements. Nowhere is more evident than in Palestine itself. And if you look at a, at a satellite photo, the areas that are green are probably Jewish settlements or Christian settlements. And the areas that are still sand are Arab settlements. Now, am I saying that the Arabs are inferior? No, not at all. They're brilliant people. There are examples from the Arabs that are wonderful examples of people doing wonderful things. But overall, the system does not work well with the rest of the world. And they get themselves cut out of world economics, and they cause hardship on everybody. It is one of the issues that we deal with. The rise of Islam started in 610. It grew very quickly, and then it seemed to have kind of quieted down for a number of centuries. But in recent years, it has expanded and is expanding very quickly. It is growing very fast in America because a lot of people are convinced that it is as good as Christianity but they're making that claim because they're looking at the weaknesses of Christianity, the hypocrisy that some people practice, just like the people of the Saudi Peninsula did in the 600s. Compare the purity of real biblical Christianity and the, the distinctiveness of pure Quran-based Islam and we're going to see a lot of conflict. And it is conflict that we are being exposed to. Our children and our grandchildren are going to be fighting these battles for the rest of their lives. We need to equip them to be able to defend Christianity. It is so easily defendable. It is, it is wonderful, the evidence and the power that we have at our disposal to justify Christianity. But if we don't equip our children, then they themselves may fall victim to thinking that Islam is a viable way of life as good as Christianity. It is not. Now simply by my saying that, that is, can you imagine how utterly politically incorrect I am in saying that? And truthfully, if we were in a big city and I said that, it probably would cause some terrible stir. My point tonight is not to cause a stir. My point tonight is to remind us of the history of the struggle of our faith and that sometimes our faith has to get very serious and rid itself of its own hypocrisy and to re-examine itself to make sure that it is truly as distinctively pure as its creator wants it to be. Our faith needs to be practiced in accordance with the instruction given us by the Word of God. And when we hold to that, then Christ is proven to be Lord of Lords, King of Kings. When we fall short of that, He is discredited. Our job 
as disciples of Jesus Christ is to stand up with our faith even in the light of the uprising of Islam or in any other system that comes along. We are equipped with the finest of faith because it was given to us by God and we can prove that. It's for us to stand up for our faith. Scott, let's sing a song together. If we can be of any help to you in your spiritual life, come right now. Let's sing together.